But if you go to Psalm chapter 11, back to Psalm 11, uh, verse 3, the Bible says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The title of the sermon tonight is, We Are a Fundamental Church. Okay, we are a fundamental church. Two weeks ago, I preached that we are an independent church. Today, I'm preaching that we are a fundamental church. Another way of saying fundamental, or fundam yeah, fundamental, is foundational. Something that's foundational is fundamental. These two words are very similar. The reason I didn't say, in our, in our logo, I didn't say independent, you know, foundational Baptist church is simply because, you know, churches of our style are known as the IFB, are known as the Independent Fundamental Baptist. So I went with that name, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. But why are we a fundamental church? Now, the first thing I want to cover is the history of fundamentalism, okay? There's a historical aspect, before we even get into the scriptures themselves, there's a historical understanding that I want you to understand about fundamentalism. Why are some Christians, why do some Christians refer to themselves as fundamentalists and some do not? Well, we've got to go back to the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, it's interesting that the timing of all this is roughly when dispensationalism as well was being accepted by many denomination, the denominations as well as the pre-trib rapture. But there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of different, different views of the Bible you know, that took place in this time. A lot of cultural trends. People were saying, hey, we can't just take the, the Bible as it's written. We also have to look at our cultural trends. We've got to see how our society has evolved to be able to understand the Scriptures in light of our new culture. Okay? There's also the progressive knowledge or the progressive sciences. Things like evolution started to take a, a foothold in the community. And the churches started to, you know, have to either answer against evolution or accept evolution in their teaching. You know, some churches started to say, well, we can understand the book of Genesis. We can understand the account of creation with evolution. You know, instead of it being six days of creation, they can say, well, each day represents millions or billions of years. You know, so there was this progressive learning that people wanted to take and, and, and change what the Word of God said. Uh, there was also the teaching of humanism. Now, humanism is kind of the idea that man is God, kind of like it's, it's about rational thinking, how we think as men by uh, not acknowledging the supernatural, not acknowledging the things that we can't see, not acknowledging a deity, but seeing just rational thinking. How can man understand this world and that, the world that we live in? And so obviously, people started to look at that versus then just taking the word of God for what it says. And of course, during that time as well, there was biblical criticism. You know, this is the time as well as all these new Bibles as well were coming into play. You know, going back and saying, well, we don't have an accurate record of what God said. You know, we don't know whether these things were really written by these authors or whether, you know, this was you know, put together by other men or can we really take this as a, as a historical uh, reading of the Word of God? And uh, there was all these kind of thoughts that were taking place in churches in the late 1800s, early 1900s before the independent fundamental Baptists even existed, okay, as we know them today. Um, and so some churches obviously started to take these ideas on board, started to preach man's wisdom rather than the Word of God, started to interpret the Word of God with this progressive learning of man. And of course, other Christians stood against that and said, hey, this isn't right. You know, the final authority we have is the Word of God. And we can't take what man says. We know the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. We know that you know, the wisdom of the man is foolishness to God. And, and so they took a stand and said, look, we need to stand against this movement. And uh, the, the first denomination that really started to take a stand against this were the Presbyterians. Okay? And then eventually other denominations started to, to uh, you know, um, do the same thing. And so when we look, look back in the early 1900s, when we talk about fundamental, fundamentals, or fundamentalism, it was, it was spread amongst a number of denominations, a, a number of Protestants. And the Baptists were one of the last to get on board. If you look at church history, the Baptists are always the last. And I reckon because we're, we're the most stubborn. Like, it takes us the longest to get on board with something. And then it takes us a long time to change once we've, we've dug our heels into, into something. And you guys can relate to that, you know, this, discussions you have with Baptists. Very hard to get them to change, you know. Even when they acknowledge that they might be in error, it takes them a long time to learn. And, and that's just, that's just the, the nature of Baptists. It takes them a long time to change. 
And, uh, but what's interesting is, even though it was the Presbyterians that started this movement against uh, Christian modernism, it was called back then, um, it was a Baptist that coined the term fundamentalism. Okay? That term fundamentalism was coined by a Baptist as, as, hey, as an identification that we stand against all this progressive learning that's taking place. You know, we take the Word of God as our final authority. So that's where the title fundamentalism came from. Okay? And it started to be applied primarily as a Christian title. Okay? Now, in those early days, in the early 1900s, um, you know, these different uh, preachers would get together from different denominations and say, okay, what makes us fundamentalists? What are we standing against? What do we need to identify? So someone that wants to believe the Word of God, that believes it's the final authority, it's the Word of God, how can they know that the church they're attending is not a fundamental church? And so they came up with these five fundamentals. Five fundamentals. And I, I just took these out of Wikipedia. But if I, I looked up... Basically, a lot of people talk about these five fundamentals, but they could be a little bit different. Like, uh, it, it's mainly saying the same thing. But I took these from Wikipedia. The five fundamentals are, number one, biblical inerrancy. Okay? So the number one thing that makes you a fundamentalist is believing that the Bible is without error. Okay? That it's perfect. And by the way, that's why we stand on the King James Bible. This is why I can tell you that we have a perfect Word of God. We can trust what it says here. And it doesn't matter what I say, what my opinions are, what your opinions are. The Word of God will always trump our opinion. Okay? That's why we stand strong in the King James Bible. Because I can actually say, I've got an inerrant Bible. Like They say the Bible's inerrant, but many of them cannot produce you that inerrant Bible. Okay? So we stand for that. Yes, I do believe that the Bible we preach from and teach from and we read from is inerrant. There is no error. It is perfect. The second fundamental is... Um, is taking the biblical accounts as literal events, okay? in particular to do with miracles. Because remember that these guys were saying, well, hey, we can, we can understand the Word of God without you know, thinking of the supernatural. You know, we just have to have rational ideas of, of how these miracles, so-called miracles, took place. Okay? And uh, so, of course, I believe in the miracles. I believe in the things that are not rational to mankind, that we don't see happen day to day, okay? I believe in the miracles. I believe that God became a man. I believe that God healed the lame and that he healed the blind and gave the blind to see. I believe all these miracles took place. I believe that Israel, when they were delivered out of Egypt, that God put down, destroyed Egypt with all these plagues, you know? I believe that the staff that Moses held in his hand became a snake, you know, as we read about in, in the accounts of Scripture. I believe all those things, so that makes us a fundamentalist. The third thing they've got is the virgin birth of Christ as a fundamental. Because obviously, if they don't believe in a miracle, then they're going to ultimately get to a point where, well, it's impossible for a virgin to give birth. So it, she must have, you know, slept around. She must have had, you know, maybe Joseph, you know. She must, have, she must have committed fornication to give birth to Christ. And so, obviously, that, that same idea of miracles. No, it's a miracle. The virgin birth of Christ was a miracle. The other thing that makes the virgin birth of Christ so important is that it reinforces his deity. Because if he just had a, 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 a natural, husband, uh, natural father and a natural mother, that would make him 100% man. Just man and nothing of God. Whereas we know that he was born of uh, Mary, who was uh, um, his mother, but also the Spirit of God came upon Mary and gave her the ability to conceive without knowing a man. So we know that Jesus Christ is 100% man and 100% God because of the virgin birth. So you can see how when you start to move away from the miracles, now you start moving away from Jesus Christ being God, right? And becomes another Jesus. So that's the third thing, the third fundamental. The fourth fundamental was the bodily res resurrection of Christ. You know, that's why you've got cults like the Jehovah Witnesses that don't believe Christ was resurrected bodily. Okay, they would not fit a fundamental church, okay? And I'm not, sure, I'm not sure of any other, I'm trying to think of other churches that don't believe in a bodily resurrection of Christ. But anyway, that was one of the fundamentals. So if people were in one of these churches that were teaching, hey, Jesus did not resurrect bodily, they would know, hey, this is not a fundamental church. And the fifth fundamental was the uh, substitution, substitution, substitutionary blood atonement of Christ. Okay, the blood atonement of Christ. That Christ came as our substitute, died on the cross for our sins, so we can go free, so we can be right through God, because God's wrath, God's judgment was put upon Jesus Christ. So these are the five fundamentals. And if you look up the five fundamentals, uh, 
like I said, there can be differences in different websites that you look at, but very, very similar. Okay? A lot of them are very similar. Maybe they're just worded slightly differently. Um, now, this was just the beginning. What happened afterwards was a bunch of Protestants and Baptists got together and they created this 12-volume, 90-essay uh, uh, booklet. Okay, well, multiple books. It's 12 volumes of books of 90 essays and 64 authors. So there's more authors to this in the Bible, right? Um, and so I, I've not read through these essays, by the way. I've not gone there, because I've got the Bible. Why, why, I don't need to go through these essays. But I'm, I just want to give you the, the historic understanding of fundamentalism, okay? Um, these essays were finalized in 1915, and then they were printed and distributed across America, distributed to missionaries across the world. And, um, and I looked through, I looked at the table of contents of these essays, and I just put out some other fundamentals that they believe in. And I'll just go through them very quickly. The deity of Christ, so we believe that. The deity of the Holy Spirit, we believe that. The existence of God, you know, I guess because of evolution and things like that. The historical accuracy of the Bible, okay, so all the archaeological evidence um, would prove the Bible right, is what, they, what they're saying. Salvation by grace through faith. Um, the inspiration of scriptures, okay. So it's not just without error, but it's been inspired. It's, it's the word of God. You know, the Holy Ghost moving men. And, and it's not just the words of men that are without error, but it's the words of God that are without error. Um, against modern philosophy and higher criticism, uh, that Jesus is also 100% man. It was against evolution. It was against Mormonism. Uh, it was teaching that prophecy had been fulfilled. Okay, so fulfillment of prophecy. Um, it taught about the physical return of Christ. Okay, the return of Christ, the coming of Christ. Um, it rejected the Roman Catholic Church. It uh, covered personal evangelism, so the need to preach the gospel, and also uh, the need for foreign missionaries to be able to preach the gospel to all nations. So, and, and there are other things, but these are just the things that I pulled out of the, the you know, just looking at the, the table of contents. And, you know, I have no problem with any of those things. You know, if I lived back then in, in the early 1900s, you know, we would be considered a fundamental church. You know, we would be considered part of fundamentalism. So, you know, I, I thought about that, that, that title. I thought about, do we really need that fundamentalism, fundament, fundamental title? Because, you know, today, fundamentalism is often associated with Islam. You know, extreme. And I'll go into that late, later on. So I thought, is it, you know, could this mislead people? But then I thought, no. You know what? It stands for something right. It stands for something honest. It stands for the Word of God as our final authority. It stands for taking the Bible literally and just believing what God says. So I thought it was important for us to be seen as a fundamental church, and that's what we are. One of the things that I thought was interesting as I went through this essay is, uh, or went through the different titles, I did look at the physical return of Christ because I know dispensationalism and pre-trib rapture was, was increasing in popularity at the same time, okay? And by the way, this is why so many independent fundamental Baptist churches are pre-trib. It's because when, they, when that movement started, it started at the same time as dispensationalism and pre-trib rapture. So it kind of went together. Um, but when I looked at it, basically the physical return of Christ as far as the fundamentals, there were three, there were three headings. The first one was that his coming will be personal. Okay, so like a bodily, local coming. Okay, not some figurative, spiritual coming of Jesus Christ, but a physical, bodily coming of Christ. That was number one. Number two, it said that his coming would be glorious. Okay, so by that they meant it'd be triumphant and it'll be like a powerful, glorious coming of Christ. Which kind of makes me scratch my head about the secret rapture. Because that's not glorious at all. <laughs> it's just secret. It doesn't, you know, like it just people disappear and nobody knows what's going on apparently. So I don't even know how the pre-trib fits that uh, understanding of the coming of, of Christ. But yeah, number two was that his coming would be glorious. And the third one, this was interesting, his coming will be imminent. Now if you guys know that word imminent, you know that it has um, uh, strong connotation toward the pre-trib rapture. So I thought, okay, is this where they're teaching about the pre-trib rapture? But I had a look, and they're saying, well, it's imminent, but it's not immediate. So I went to the dictionary and looked up the two words, and they mean exactly the same thing, the cinnamons one to another. So it's, it's, it's imminent, but it's not immediate, they're saying. Um, and what they mean, I had a look, and he goes, this is what we mean. He goes, every believer should have an expectation that Christ might come in their lifetime. 
That's what he meant by imminent, this, this author of this essay, that every believer should uh, consider that Christ might come in their lifetime. I have no problem with that. You know, Christ m- might come in my lifetime. You know, I'm watching, I'm waiting, I'm hoping for Christ. But at the same time, he could come in a hundred years from now. You know what I mean? I don't know. But, you know, I, I am looking for the, the coming of Christ. So, you know, I do believe it could be in my lifetime. So, no problem there at all. But there was one thing in particular that I thought was interesting. And sorry, it's, I'm going a little bit off topic, but I thought it was interesting. I just put out a little um, extract out of that essay, and it says this. Uh, talking about, you know, uh, the coming of Christ, it says, The gospel must first be preached to all nations. Matthew 24, 14, which is kind of funny because Matthew 24 says after the tribulation. But anyway, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. The church must continue to make disciples of all the nations even until the end of the age. This is therefore a time not for unkindly criticisms of fellow Christians, but for friendly conference, not for disputing over divergent views, but for united action, not for dogmatic assertion of prophetic programs, but for the humble acknowledgement that we know in part, not for idle dreaming, but for the immediate task of evangelizing a lost world. And so what was interesting is, this guy's not saying it's a preacher rapture, but he's saying, look, there are believers that hold different views, okay? But just because we hold different views, that shouldn't stop us from being able to work together to preach the gospel to every nation. And I'm a big supporter of that, you know? I have no problem if a pre-trip believer wants to be part of this church as long as they want to get on the program, the three main goals, preach the gospel, baptize believers, and teach all things in the Word of God. If you're on board with that, hey, you're welcome to this church. You don't need to believe in a post-trip pre raf which is, and I've not taught them that yet, but, you know, I just wish more Baptist preachers would be like this author and say, hey, you know what? We do differ on this. Yes, it is an important doctrine. We do differ, but let's not stop that from having us work together for the cause of Christ, for the gospel's sake. So, you know, I just wish other people were like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm definitely like that. So I just wanted to show you the history of fundamentalism. We line up perfectly. I have no problem. Look, I'm, I'm sure if I read through the 90 essays, I'll find things I disagree with. I'm not going to bother doing that. But I'm just showing you as the, as the, as the core teachings um, you know, yep, we line up perfectly with, with, with fundamentalism. So, moving on to biblical fundamentalism, okay? Now, turn to 1 Kings chapter 5. 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 13. 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 13. Verse 13. The Bible says, and King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel. And what's a levy? That's a tax, right? When you think of a levy, that's a tax. And King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel, and the levy was 30,000 men. <laughs> so normally when someone raises a levy or raises a tax, it's money, right? The government wants money from you. But this tax, this levy, is like, we need men. We need workers, you know? Verse 14. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month by, course, by courses. A month they were in Lebanon, and two months at home. So King Solomon gets these, you know, Israelites, 10,000 in courses, so it's this rotating roster, where one month they'd be in Lebanon, and two months they'd be at home, okay? And the whole purpose of this was to build the temple of God. And primarily, what we're reading about here is building the foundations of the temple of God. Um... And then in verse 15, And Solomon had three score and 10,000 that bear burdens. So if you don't know what a score is, a score is 20. So three score is three times 20, that's 60, and 10, that's 70. So he had 70,000 that bear burdens. So he had 70,000 laborers, okay? And four score, four times 20, 80, four score, 80,000 hewers in the mountains. So he had 80,000 people that would go into these quarries in the, into the mountains, mining rock for the foundation of the temple. And then in verse 16, Beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, 3,300, which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. So these are 3,300 supervisors overseeing all these workers. Um, and the king commanded that they brought great stones costly stones and hewed stones to lay the foundation of the house. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders did hew them and the stone squ- uh, squarers 
and they prepared timber and stones to build the house. So I just want to show you how important it was when Israel went to build the house of the Lord, the temple in the Old Testament, how important it was to get as many people as possible, as many workers as they could manage to work and mine for these rocks. The Bible says, what were they? They were great stones. So they weren't just little pebbles they were mining. They were getting, they were cutting out of that mountain. Great stones for the foundation of the temple. Costly stones. And I don't know if that costly means, um, uh, like it can be expensive because of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the manpower required to do that. But I think it's probably got more to do with like marble, kind of expensive stones, things that are, are not uh, easy to mine and that are extra strong than your average stone. And then it says, and hewed stone. So these stones were cut, they were smoothed out, they were worked on to lay the foundation of the house. Okay, so what I want to show you just as a principle, how important a foundation is, okay? How important being a fundamentalist is, okay? Having, before we can build anything, we must have a strong foundation, okay? Solomon, who is wise, what did it say there? Uh, well, actually, I didn't read that. Verse 12. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom. Okay? So Solomon had the wisdom. When he goes, I'm going to build this house of the Lord, I must have strong foundations. And I want you to have the wisdom of Solomon and you, that you can say to yourself, hey, we need strong foundations in our life. We need strong foundations in our church. Turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 8. Hebrews 11, verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, so we're talking about Abraham now, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which have foundations. Okay? So uh, Abraham, when he was called by God to leave his people, to leave his family, to leave his nation, he went with this promise, this promise that was also given to Isaac and Jacob. And a lot of people think, you know, there was an earthly representation of that, which was the land of Israel, which was the land of Canaan, the promised land. There was an earthly representation of that, yes. But the city that he was looking for was a city with foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Okay, he was looking for this place, and I would say that's heaven, I would say that's New Jerusalem. Okay, we read about New Jerusalem in Revelation with these foundations of very costly stones, and it has the name of the apostles written on those foundations. So I believe that ultimately he was referring to that New Jerusalem. But I just want to show you that the foundation was important. Not just a foundation, but a foundation whose builder and maker is God. Okay? And so we ought to be like Abraham. What did it say in verse 8? By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, in a strange country. Okay? We ought to be here in, our, in Australia, here on the Sunshine Coast, we ought to be the same way. We ought to be so, seen as sojourners. We ought to be see, see, people as, like, be seen as, as someone in a strange country. Okay, why? Because our home is heavenly. Our home is the New Jerusalem. We're looking for a, a city whose foundations and the builder and the maker is God. Okay, we ought to be the same way. We ought to, ought to get stuck in our ways and think, well, this is our home. Let's get settled in. Let's get comfortable. No, be a sojourner in this land. Don't get too comfortable with where you are and be prepared to go where the Lord wants you to go, to do the things that God wants you to do. Look for the foundations that are built by God, not foundations that are built by man, okay? So we need to be like Abraham. Now go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, one of Jesus' teachings. We know it very well. Luke chapter 6, verse 48. Luke 6, 48. So why are we fundamentalists? Why is this a fundamental church? Because we want foundations whose builder and maker is God. Okay? Luke 6, 48. Uh, let me see if I should start before that, actually. Luke 6. Let's start in verse 40, 46. 
Luke 6, 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. So the one that listens to God, who listens to the teachings of Jesus Christ, okay, who does the things that Jesus says to do, he says, I'll show you what they're like. Okay? In verse 48, he is like a man which built a house and dig deep. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the fundamentals of the house. We're talking about the foundations of the house. He's going to build a house, but he wants to dig deep. Okay? And lay the foundation on a rock. Okay? Something stable. A rock like, the, like what the uh, Old Testament um, temple of God was built. On, on these uh, huge rocks. And when the, flood ca- the, when, sorry, when, when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it. Why? For it was founded upon a rock. And I want us to be Christians that are not shaken when the trials of, the, of life comes our way. I don't want to be a church that's shaken when the opposition comes and says, hey, you're preaching hate. Hey, you're preaching too hard. No, we're going to build our foundations and we're not going to be vehemently moved like this man was that built his house upon a strong foundation, which is that rock. Verse 49, But he that heareth and doeth not. So the one that, 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 uh, that hears what Jesus says but doesn't do them is like a man that without our foundation built a house upon the earth, okay, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. So let me tell you, if you want to destroy a church, build it upon the earth. Build it upon the sand. Don't build it upon the rock of God's word. Okay? If we want to destroy this church tomorrow, let's just move away from the teachings of Christ, move away from the rock, from the words of God, move away from doing the words of God. That's another thing. I can preach the words of God, but we can say, hey, let's not do them. That's another sure way to destroy our church. But no, we're a fundamental church. We're going to set the word of God as our foundation, and we're going to build upon that, work, uh, that word, so we're not going to be vehemently moved, and our house is not going to fall down and be ruined by those, uh, b- w- when he gets beaten upon, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.11, I'll just read that to you, you don't need to turn there. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So not just the Word of God as our foundation, but Jesus Christ. Okay, remember, he came to set an example. He came to deliver us from our sins. So we set that as our foundation, yes, we're here because we've trusted on Christ. Now, what are the examples that Christ left us? Let's do those examples. Let's walk like we sang, footprints of Jesus. Let's follow those footprints of Jesus in our life. Okay? Let's, let's do what we hear the Word of God says. And that is our foundation. And then we can build everything else, all our other doctrines, all our other teachings, all our other ministries upon that foundation, which is Jesus Christ and His Word. Ephesians 2.19, I'll just read it to you. Ephesians 2.19 to 22. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So here uh, Paul is writing to the Ephesians, to these Gentiles, and says, hey, you're no longer strangers, you're no longer foreigners to Israel. Okay? You're fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we know Jesus is our foundation. But not just that, but the foundation is upon the apostles and prophets. Guess where we read about the apostles and prophets? Right here. Right? This is where we read what they wrote. This is where we can read about what they said. And Jesus Christ is that chief cornerstone. So he's like the foundation of the foundation. Okay? We get it from the word of God. Talking, and then talking about us, talking about the church, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So when you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells in you, comes and lives in you, and it describes just like the holy temple in the Old Testament that was built upon those strong foundations. It says, hey, the Bible is a strong foundation in which our church, our building ought to be built upon. Okay? And our church is the house of the Lord in the New Testament. It's an amazing thing to think God looks at us and says, hey, I'm going to indwell here. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be in my house. As little as we are of a size of a church, 
But God still looks at this church and says, hey, that's my house and that's where I'm going to dwell as long as we have the foundation of Christ and the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. Now, I'm almost done. So, Islamic fundamentalism. I find it so weird that people refer to Islam, well, extreme Islam, terrorist Islam, as fundamental Islam. Now, there's probably some truth to that, okay? Because their book, their holy book does teach that they need to go and kill the infidels. So in some way, they are fundamentalists. They are believing what their holy book says, okay? But I was looking this up. I found it interesting. Why would you give this, this, this term fundamentalism that was coined by a Christian, that was coined by a Baptist, why is it now being used to describe Islam terrorism? And I pulled this out of Wikipedia. It says this, the Iran hostage crisis of 1979-80, so I don't know, this was before I was born, marked a major turning point in the use of the term fundamentalism. So it was this hostage crisis, this act of terrorism, that was a turning point for the use of the term fundamentalism. The media, of course, right? <laughs> the media, in an attempt to explain the ideology of Ayatollah Khomeini and the Iranian revolution of a Western audience, described it as a fundamentalist version of Islam by way of analogy to the Christian fundamentalist movement in the United States. So the Christians that, termed, that coined the term fundamentalism because we stand for the word of God, the media saw this hostage crisis, saw this act of terrorism and said, well, they're like the Christians. <laughs> Let's call them Islamic fundamentalism. And that's why you keep hearing this in the media to this day. And that's why now fundamentalism has this negative connotation of this, you know, people that just want to go and, and murder, uh, you know, without law. Uh, thus was born the term Islamic fundamentalist, which became a common use of the term in the following years. So we can see how the media, you know, took this term of the Christians, brainwashed society, and now we're calling Islamic terrorism fundamentalism. I wonder why. You know, I, I, just, I just think about the Antichrist coming. Hey, we need to take care of these fundamentalists. Hey, we've got to bring peace in the world. We've got to take care of these fundamentalists. We've got to take care of these people that are going around killing, you know, raping women, murdering. Oh, and the Christians as well, the Christian fundamentalists as well. You know, we've got to take care of those as well. So I, I just found that unusual and, and very, very weird. But it doesn't surprise me that the media is the one that wants to taint this, this title. Hey, but I'm going to wear it proudly, proudly okay? We are a fundamental church. In conclusion, we read this already in Psalms 11. If you can go back to Psalm 11, that'll be good. Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed... So this is a thought. This is a thought of David, okay? Or the psalmist. I'm not sure if it's David that wrote this in Psalm 11. Oh, it is. It says here, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. It says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Okay? So, without the foundations... Without the Word of God, without Jesus Christ, Christians, the righteous, just have no hope. They have no goal anymore. What can the righteous do? What can you do without the Word of God? Nothing. Again, this just becomes a social club. You know, we can't win souls because we're not, we're not talking about Christ. We're not talking about His sacrifice. What can the righteous do? But if we have a look at the context here, it says at the beginning of verse 1, In the Lord put I my trust. In the Lord put I my trust. What is the foundations of David? It's the Lord. The Lord is who he's put his trust in. Why? How say you to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? So someone was telling David, hey, run, flee. Remember, David was always under attack. He always had enemies against him. And someone was saying, hey, just flee. Flee as a bird to your mountains. But remember, he said, no. In the Lord put I my trust, for lo... The wicked, so this is the one that's saying flee. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privately, privately shoot at the upright in heart. So there are people that want to hurt the upright in heart. Now, I'm not righteous of my own. I'm righteous because the imputed righteousness of Christ is upon me. But there are those that want to hurt Christians, that want to damage Christianity. But we just say, hey, in the Lord put on my trust. My foundation is the Lord. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Hey, we're not going to flee like a bird to the mountain. We're going to stand on the foundations of God. We're going to stand on Jesus Christ. Verse 4. 
The Lord is in his holy temple. Why are we so confident in our Lord? Why can we put our trust in the Lord and not be moved? The Lord is in his holy temple, talking about heavenly um, Jerusalem. The Lord's throne is, is in heaven. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold his eyelids try the children of men. So these people that want to hurt believers, that want to hurt Christianity, he says, look, God sees them. Okay, God knows what's going on. It's not like we need to tell God, hey, God, help us. You, you, you're not helping us. God knows. What, we should ask him to help us. Hey, but he knows what's going on, right? He tries. He says in verse 5, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. People, hey, guys, look, there are people in this world that the Lord hates. Okay, let's just, let's not pretend. Like, that's what we just read. Are we fundamentalists or not? Do we believe the word of God or do I need to explain this away? God hates those that are trying to hurt the righteous. He hates the wicked. He hates those that love violence. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Talking about God's final wrath upon them, you know, either future, the future wrath to come or hell, whatever, however you want to look at that. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. So the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. He hates the wicked, but he loves righteousness. And I'm just reminded with this whole same-sex marriage nonsense, this postal vote that Australia voted for, some 60%, some 60% of our nation believes it's fine for two men to get married. Has the world gone nuts? Two women to get married. What in the world? But what does the Lord say? Hey, I'm going to have foundations. Hey, I'm not going to get rid of my foundations. I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. And I know that the Lord hateth the wicked. The Lord hates the fact that 60% of Australians support homosexuality. It drives me insane to think about that. Okay? But what makes us fundamentalists? It means that I hold this word of God above everything else. I don't care if 60% of my Australians said it's fine. When the Word of God says it's not fine, then I'm just going to stand on the Word of God. If God says the death penalty is applicable to the crime of homosexuality, hey, I'm a fundamentalist. That's what I believe. I believe the Word of God. So I support the death penalty on homosexuals. Okay? The least thing I'm worried about is them getting married. But it's, it, should I be surprised? Should I be surprised when our nation allows 250 babies to be aborted every day? I mean, that's even worse. 250 babies being killed every single day in abortion clinics. It's even worse than homosexuals getting married. This is, it shouldn't, shouldn't surprise me. But am I going to flee? Am I going to flee from this? No. I'm going to put my trust in the Lord and I'm going to stand strong on the foundations because we are a fundamental church. Nothing's going to change that. No matter what persecution we may face, no matter what problems I might face preaching the Word of God that's been in existence for hundreds of years, people have been preaching this for hundreds of years, I tell you now, this change in our, in our laws, or not, it hasn't changed in our laws just yet, but this change in culture is just going to have other pastors behind the pulpit supporting homosexuality more than ever. There's going to be more homosexuality in churches more than ever. And I'm telling you the truth, I will never, in my knowledge, know, I will never allow a homosexual in this church. Never, ever, any pedophile, any homosexual, any reprobate like that, never, ever will I allow them to come into this church and become predators to people here in this church, okay? I'm just telling you the truth. You know, if it happens by accident, it happens because I didn't know, okay? Just to tell you, I'll never allow that. These people ought to be put to death like the Bible says, and I can say that because I'm a fundamentalist. Let's pray.